Chairman of the Society of Authors, honoured not only as a Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire, but also, I understand, uniquely with your husband, Harold Pinter, as a Companion of Honour. And I well remember the first time I met Antonia, which was at a dinner given by Lord Weidenfeld in 1979, where I recognised everybody and knew nobody. <laughs> but I have also, in the strange situation, of having been something of a friend of her parents, um, particularly of Elizabeth Longford, who was so incredibly kind to us youngsters, and that takes me, I'm afraid, back to about 1971. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here in the Wigmore Hall, and, and I perhaps can begin with that traditional question, do you come here often? I come here as often as I can, and when I was a child growing up, my favourite um, visit in London was to the Tower of London. Now, my favourite visit is definitely to the Wigmore Hall. It's my favourite place in London. And um, during lockdown, of course, there were these wonderful live streams for which I and everyone, I think, was terribly grateful. Wonderful. Well, um, we're here today to talk about um, Antonia's latest book about Caroline Norton, 1808 to 1877, a 19th century heroine who wanted justice for women, and to learn more about her your, more about your life and approach to history, not forgetting your love of music and poetry. So can I just begin with a quick word about Caroline Norton? Indeed, um, why Caroline? I wanted to do a book about her law case um, because I think they're dramatic and I'm very interested in the law. I used to call myself a, a, a lawyer monkey. One of my grandchildren misunderstood it as a lawyer monkey. So <laughs> <laughs> you see before you a lawyer monkey. And I dimly had heard of this case, but nothing really much about it. And I asked my granddaughter, Honor, who was then reading for the bar, now a barrister, to find me the trial, which she brilliantly did. And the moment I read the trial, I was completely hooked. It's so dramatic, 1836, and when the Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne, was sued for adultery with Caroline by her husband, George Norton. And that's the sort of dramatic centre of the book. And this um, ties in to some extent with a couple of other books that you've done over around about that period? Yes, I, I did a book um, called Perilous Question about the Great Reform Mill of 1832, yes. and then one about Catholics getting votes and rights, Catholic emancipation, called The King and the Catholics in 1829. And I did realise that I'd never actually written about women's rights since I wrote The Weaker Vessel about women in the 17th century. I've always been interested, you know, I've done a lot of biographies of women, not, not only queens, tragic queens, but also sort of multiple biographies, Henry VIII's wives, Louis XIV's loves. So um, it seemed to me a wonderful subject, right from the very beginning, combining a dramatic trial um, uh, with women's rights and the possibility of justice and reform. But I had no idea what Caroline Norton was like. Excellent. Well, I'd love to come back to that a little bit later, but if I could sort of wind you back to the beginning. Um, can I ask you the question, did you, did you have a privileged childhood, do you think? Well, it depends what you call privilege. Um, certainly it wasn't privileged in the sense of wealth, because my father was a second son, and a don. We lived in Oxford and there was nothing privileged about that. Um, on the other hand, I had two great privileges. One, as you know, my parents had an ideally happy marriage for 70 years, as it turned out. And um, that sort of echoed in our childhood. And the other one was my mother was very keen on women's education. She'd been to Oxford herself in the 20s. And so I could be good at school, bad at school, it didn't matter. I was going to go to Oxford. And I, th I see now that was a privilege for my generation. Yes, and in fact, of course, they came from rather different backgrounds, didn't they? Those yes, my, my father was an Anglo-Irish Protestant aristocrat who became Labour and Catholic. And my mother came from Birmingham family of Unitarians. And Chamberlains, who, yes. Hmm? Wasn't the Chamberlains? Chamberlain. Yes. Her, her mother was a Chamberlain. Yes. Um, and they were indeed very different, and the result, as I said, was great happiness. 
Well, looking in um, the index of your mother's memoirs in relation to you, I find the following references. References to appearance, precocity, imaginative life, early feminism, early literary interests and skill in publishing, marriage and literary career. Um, precocity. Um, would you say that you were precocious when young? Um, no, I wish, I wish my mother told me at the time I was precocious. <laughs> I don't think... Um, what I was, I was a very early reader, ah. and that could give an air of precocity, um, particularly to visiting grown-ups, because I was also a very quick reader. My mother taught me to read. I was slightly frightened of her, so I just got on, on with it and read. And grown-ups used to throw me something by Walter Scott and say, read that, and half an hour later I'd give them the plot, and they'd have to give me half a crown. Goodness, you must have made a fortune <laughs> in relative terms at any rate, yes. And your father wrote of your astonishing success and he added, for a long time, her beauty and the quickness of her wit were recognized, but not sheer strength of her brain. This could be denied no longer after Mary, Queen of Scots. She lay intellectually fallow during her late teens, but then I did precisely the same at Eton. Would you say you were Intellectually fallow at a, fa at a particular phase, do you think? Intellectually fallow makes me sound like a field, doesn't it? It does a bit. <laughs> I think I was like a field. Um, well, my father, as far as I was concerned, took no interest in my education. Um, I didn't know that he'd sort of, that he'd noticed. Um, I think what he means is that at Oxford, I decided to take a degree in pleasure. Ah. Um, uh, you know, whereas uh, I, I did get a scholarship to Oxford, I might have perhaps done a bit more work, um, but I'd worked very hard in my school days, and I proceeded to work very hard afterwards. So it was rather perverse of me to take a degree in pleasure. Nevertheless, <laughs> they were happy days. But also you had rather an interesting group of people around you at Oxford, didn't you, at that time? It seemed um, to me. Uh, the, um, the people I was with, uh, with um, John Julius Norwich, was yes. a marvellous friend. Whatever John Julius had been to or seen, he'd enjoyed more than anything else. He was so exhilarating. People like that. Philip Ziegler, excellent historian. Yes, Marigold Johnson. Marigold not, Johnson, yes. went on to marry. Then Marigold Hunt. Right, went, went, on, went on to marry Paul Johnson. Yes. Yes. Um, and then um, your father also wrote, Elizabeth takes a maternal interest in the politics of Antonia and Harold. Antonia, Elizabeth's view, is strictly non-party. I don't think that she admires any contemporary politicians. Her heroes and heroines belong to history. Would you think that was fair? Um, no, I did admire Mr Attlee. Um, yes. Who was the Prime Minister that my father... Uh, whose cabinet my father joined. I admired him very much. And there's a very good biography of him by John Bew, which made, him, made me admire him even more. Better than the, what was that remark they always said about him, an, an empty taxi drew up and Mr Attlee got out of it. Rather unfair. I, 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 that joke was repeated so many times, I used to want to stuff people into the taxi themselves. <laughs> Dear, well, I'll resist going into the taxi for the time being. <laughs> but anyway, you've written that good history books should combine scholarship, readability, and a quality that you call humanity. Well, a sense that these were people, that, the, uh, uh, you know, they were proud, envious, jealous, kind, um, generous, exactly like you and me, except, of course, that they were kings, queens and princesses. And I think it's um, somehow managing to convey both sides, that they were both just like us, and in another sense, completely different. That's the art of biography. Yes. And, um, I mean, you've spoken about reading. You obviously had a great love for reading, um, but to bring all this alive, you need somebody to inspire you. Were there any particular people, teachers or others, who, who, who instilled that love into you and, and sort of made you think in a different way? I loved history privately until I went to St Mary's Ascot, and there was a wonderful nun, they were all nun teachers in those yes, days, absolutely. called Mother Mercedes, and she... Uh, she was just one of those marvellous teachers you're lucky to encounter. And more than anything in the world, I wanted to please Mother Mercedes. And uh, she liked the Empress um, 
Maria Theresa, and once or twice when I was writing Marie Antoinette, her daughter, of course, I thought, Mother Mercedes won't like this, because I was quite critical of the Empress. But I was passionately keen to win the Ascot History Prize, and I prayed lots of prayers and worked very hard, wrote an essay designed to please Mother Mercedes. Prize day, up gets Mother Ignatius. The prize for history has been won by Antonia Packenham. Yuppie. No one else went in for the prize at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you won nonetheless, which is it's great. Um, as we're in the Wigmore Halls, it'd be interesting to know a little bit about your um, connection with music and your love of music and how, how that came about and, and what well, that's we brought you to. Well, we weren't a musical... Oh, we were a very bookish household, but not um, musical. And really, um, my first boyfriend, called Patrick Lindsay, took me to the opera... Um, the Marriage of Figaro, and mm. from then on I associated opera and love and um, got a passion for opera. And then I had the great good luck of working when I was 21 for George Weidenfeld, and he took me to the whole ring cycle in one week, George Jolte, um, mm. and that was a real privilege to go with him, so I was never bothered by any of the possible things to say about Wagner personally. I just went with the music and the opera. So those were two marvellous things for me. But music became very um, wound up with my books when I was writing Mary Queen of Scots. A lawyer friend of mine suggested that her life was like Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony. You know, this marvellous beginning. Um, yes. And I, I thought that was quite interesting and I used to play it over and over again as I wrote. So literally would you be playing it sort of every day? I mean, oh, yes, all, and just, several times a day perhaps. Yes. That's wonderful. And then um, when I was writing about the gunpowder plot, I used to play Thomas Tallis because he was involved in that world. He was a Catholic. I found that inspiring. And then when I wrote about Marie Antoinette, who did I find but young Mozart, who she knew as a child, is alleged to have given her a kiss. And even some people say, proposed to her, which I think is one of those marvellous stories I'm determined to believe. <laughs> yes. Um, but, you know, I, I like that. I like that accompaniment. Yes, it's wonderful, I think, that. It's really good. Um, because writing books wasn't your first immediate job after Oxford, was it? You, um, here we, we share, in fact, two, two remarkable figures. The first one, George Weidenfeld, with what you described as his enormous eyes like gooseberries, ever on the lookout for new projects. Yes, it was very um, exciting working for him. It was like being at a university, you know, because he brought European culture um, into my life. And yes. I'll always be grateful to him. Yes, and he was your publisher? He then became, became my publisher. Yes. I was just working, I was just an ordinary What did you person. have to do when you were working for him? I did everything. Everything. Um, I wrote advertisements. And Weidenfeld and Nicholson is spelt, Nicholson has no H, which is its absolute right. Sunday morning, George Weidenfeld would wake up, look at the advertisement, there would be an H there. He'd ring me. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you once have to sort of um, look after Harold Nicholson, didn't you, on one occasion? Um, well, With... I was asked by George to go up and talk to him because the dinner was going on rather a long time. Um, it was when people started coming in after dinner. Yes. Except George was such a marvellous host that dinner wasn't over. Um, and he said, go up, go up, go up and talk to him. I went to talk to him. Harold Nicholson was very angry indeed, like an angry Father Christmas. I don't blame him. Um, and I want to recall the next day he wrote me a very polite letter apologising. Oh, that's nice. And at one point, um, I mean, uh, George sent you off to work with Cecil Beaton. Yes, that was an honour. Cecil Beaton was working on a book called The Glass of Fashion, which you as his biographer know all about. And I was asked to turn up on the morning at nine o'clock in the morning and um, sort of, if I say sort of edit the book, it sounds presumptuous, because I didn't edit it, I ended by writing it, <laughs> <laughs> yes. which was easier. And the only trouble was that I was at that stage, I was 22, 
I was experimenting with my hair. And I used to go early to the hairdresser. One terrible day, I turned up with a, a purple auburn tint. And Cecil looked at me quite faintly with complete horror and managed to say in a strangled voice, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were, well, but he was, a, as you know, and as you brought out brilliantly, he, he was a wonderful man to work for. Yes, he was highly professional, wasn't he, in yes. every possible way. Yes. And very generous, took photographs of my wedding, some yes. of the best photographs I've ever had. And looking at me, looking marvellous, dressed up as Mary Queen of Scots, there was a moment when he said, open piggies. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> but I think he rather liked to disconcert, didn't he? And that's one of the things he Certainly did. Certainly disconcerted me. <laughs> yes, he was good at that. But then, I mean, you presumably saw him a number of times over the years, but you also, I was reading in um, Must You Go, that you ran into him with Clarissa Avon at, at a, just not long before he died, and you said that um, he was an advertisement for the, for the stroke from which he has recovered, full of chat and malice. <laughs> well, you've written this wonderful book <laughs> called Malice in Wonderland about him. He, he was full of chat and malice, that's accurate, don't you think? I do. I hope, I hope in my book there's more Wonderland than malice, but I'm not <laughs> quite sure that it comes out occasionally. But um, he did have that very particular thing, didn't he, of being able to put somebody absolutely into the, the right little box and yes. move it up and down according no, to whatever. I, I admired him very much. Yes. I mean, he was not only a good photographer, but also he also captured people in words too, yes. which was rather interesting. Well, um, you did say that you were not an academic, but um, academics being people, in a sense, who confine themselves to one period of history. Um, you, you've tackled lots of different areas. Well, I, I can only write about what grabs and interests me. And I'm certainly not an academic because an academic uh, will explore and go deeper and we need them, you know, they, they are the absolute, um, the roots of history. Um, I rather like discovering, I like working on things I don't know much about mm -hmm. and sort of knowing more about it at the end and producing a book that's just personal. Finding a particular character that appeals to you and yes, exploring... But, but sort of recreating it, bringing it back to life. Yes. That's what I, that's what I want to do. And um, you've used the phrase, um, which I rather enjoyed, um, it, does it even appear in a tax statement, optical research? Yes. I invented that because for tax purposes it means going to a place and looking at it. But I do think, seriously, that it's most important to go and... Okay. see things, until I saw um, the room where Paul Rizzio was murdered in front of Mary Queen of Scots' eyes. She was highly pregnant with James the Sixth and First future. I didn't realise how tiny it was yes. and how big the fireplace, um, which no description can give you. I mean, that's just one example. No, uh, very important, I think, and enjoyable too, isn't it? It's oh, going frightfully to enjoyable. see these places. And it puts it all into a context, because sometimes otherwise you, you know, would get things terribly wrong if you don't go and have a look. There were only um, problems um, when Harold was kindly driving me about when we were doing, I was doing Charles II, and um, we were in Worcestershire, and whenever Harold saw a cricket match, he was inclined to stop, and in vain, because he was a cricket fanatic, in vain I said, you know, Charles II didn't play cricket, he didn't hear. <laughs> <laughs> but you managed to get it, you managed to leave him at the cricket match and explore a bit on your own, presumably. Yes. Hopefully. Um, well, the first one that I read many years ago, I remember it very well, was Mary Queen of Scots. And of course, I can never get out of my head that poignant scene of, well, terrifying scene of her execution. In fact, yes. I, I reread it the other night. It completely put me off my dinner, I have to say. Well, I'm sorry about that. But <laughs> I mean, I, I, I will always be moved by that scene, and as I should be, you know, and, and I've done my best to describe it. And actually, I can, although it came out 52 years ago, so I wrote it 53 years ago. Yes. I can still remember writing it, and the tears pouring down my cheeks, and thinking, no, the tears must come from the reader and stopping and writing it again more calmly. Right, that's very interesting. 
And, and at the end of the day, did you see Mary, Queen of Scots, perhaps differently from the way others had seen her, do you think? I mean, presumably you're sympathetic towards her. I don't think I'm the right judge of that, ah. you know, um, because there have been many excellent books on Mary, mm -hmm. Queen of Scots. Um, it's just what you have is my Mary, Queen of Scots. Yes. And similarly with Marie Antoinette, I mean, she also suffered a terrible fate, didn't yes, she? Yes, terrible. Um, uh, again, I find it very difficult. I always mark the day of her uh, execution, October the 16th. Um, I remember her. Yes. You also wrote The Six Wives of Henry VIII. I mean, they're all, they all have sort of different qualities, don't they? And um, aims and ambitions, I guess. Uh, do you have any sort of a silly question, any particular favourites amongst them or anyone that you Well, like? I think it's rather like children. You like the one that you feel maybe is neglected. Yes. And I think Catherine of Aragon, the first one, is slightly neglected by history. People are so busy explaining why Henry went off with Anne Boleyn. They forget about Catherine and quite a long history and first marriage to his brother, yes. you know, and life as a Spanish princess. She was a very interesting, strong character. And um, it wasn't her fault that she had a daughter. It was treated like a sort of criminal. Awful, awful those times. Mm. You, you had a quite a funny run in with Prince Philip on the subject, didn't you, at one point? About... I, I <laughs> had the honour of going to lunch at Buckingham Palace because of um, Vaslav Havel, our friend, then. Um, President of Czechoslovakia was going to lunch, so we were asked. And I knew he was going to ask me what I was writing, which is a quite legitimate question. And he did. And I said, with great pleasure, I'm writing about the six wives of Henry VIII, sir. And Duke of Edinburgh said, why does everyone write about the wives? Why don't they write about Henry VIII? And I said, obsequiously, oh, yes, sir. He was a very interesting man. I mean, he didn't actually write green sleeves, but he was very interesting. Yes, he was. He bashed the French. He bashed the French. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Do you actually think it's um, easier to write about women than men, would you say, um, or not? Or see we, history through the prism of women? Um, Could, I am the author of Cromwell. Yes, so yes. that doesn't... Yes. yes. Yeah, um, I think that's, again, impossible to say, really. Um, I, I mean, my, I urgently want to be true. I, yes, I could yes. never, ever misquote something deliberately um, that didn't, didn't suit me, you know, to make it better. I, that, that would be, you know... I, I don't mean I've never told lies in life, but I couldn't, couldn't tell a lie over a document. Well, no, I think biography has to be the quest for the truth, doesn't it, to get as close yes. to the truth as possible. We never yeah. perhaps actually get absolutely to the truth, but we've got mm. to try. Um, yeah. I mean, I personally find it easier to write about women than men, because I think there's a certain courtesy in a male author writing about a woman. But yes. I just, I don't know. Nice. I'm glad. <laughs> yes. And then, of course, you, you wrote a very interesting book, Must You Go, about, about Harold Pinter, and that was very much based on diaries. And so I wanted to ask you, do you um, did you just keep a diary during that phase, or have you kept oh, one no. all the way? Through? I started a diary in October 1968, when I'd just handed in Mary Queen of Scots. Mm. And I felt, you know, postnatal, really. I'd worked on it and lived with it for so long. I started a diary, and... Um, so I naturally had a diary. Yes. And I drew on that diary for Must You Go, which was our life together. Yes. Um, and that was my morning. I began it the month after he died. And my way of mourning, I mean, as a painter, I paint and a poet write poetry. I mourned by writing that book. Yes. But you, you hadn't kept it, you'd only kept sort of pocketbooks when you were very young, is that right? I mean, you hadn't really kept Oh, yes, I, I, I had little diaries when I was young, but um, the, the diary I used to write by hand, and sometimes I graduated to typewriter before I had a computer. 
Yes, and do you still do you still keep that up now? No, because no. when I was writing Must You Go, I realised I was writing a diary about a woman writing a book about a diary. Right. And uh, so I stopped. But now I write an account of particular occasions. Oh, yes, yes. yes. I mean, I've always thought that um, when you're actually writing the book, it's a bit like performing, you know. Yes. Writing a diary is a bit like practising yes. to some extent. Yeah. And then when you're actually writing the book, you, you haven't really got time to do the no. practising at the same time. Anyway, I'd love to get back to, to Caroline, to Caroline Norton. Um, she was a Sheridan originally, right? She was born Sheridan, um, Car- the granddaughter of Richard Brinsley Sheridan, the playwright and politician. And then... Uh, Marrying George Norton, I mean, um, a, a woman's role to love, suffer and obey. I mean, he seemed a particularly nasty piece of work, even by the standards of the time, would you think? Or I think he was obsessionally in love with her when he married her and she was 19. And the trouble with being obsessional is that you can't bear any sort of rivalry. And she was bright and very pretty and she loved social life very interested in politics. They differed politically. He was a Tory, not to say an ultra-Tory. She was Whig. Yes. And he got jealous of her. And then I'm afraid he started what is now called domestic abuse, for which there can never be any excuse uh, uh, then or now, you know. No. Um, And so um, I think the case brought against Melbourne was inspired by all this kind of hatred and politics. His brother, Lord Grantley, yes. and another ultra-Tory peer, Lord Winford, so, sort of probably spurred him on, saying it would harm the Prime Minister. And, uh, were those sort of cases extremely unusual at that time? I mean, to cite the Prime Minister? Mm, it or... was called criminal conversation. Yes. They weren't so unusual. Melbourne had been subject to one before. Right. Um, and Caroline's father, Tom Sheridan, subject to one before he was married to her mother. Yes. And, and did she start writing um, <clears throat> fiction and poetry and things on, for magazines when she, after she married? I mean, she started to do that. Oh, well, I think she also ma- wrote as a young girl. Yes. Pe- people did. Writing was something girls, women could do. I mean, I think she, she wrote, she always wrote, you know, write a poem, write a book, write a little essay, you know, I, I, I think that she, she was a writer, as some people are. Yes, and, what, about, and what, um, what do you think at the end of the day was going on with Lord Melbourne? Um... Did they or didn't they? It's a good <laughs> question. Readers of my book have differed, which I find interesting. And I've, again, I've been honest. I've given all the evidence yes. while making it clear. I personally think they didn't can I put it, go the whole way? Right. Um, and I give a list of reasons I don't think that. But one rather convincing one is to do with the trial. All the evidence of the servants, which is quite um, raunchy, shall we say. Indeed. Um, all yes. depends on the servants having been summoned by a bell. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been there. They're summoned by a bell, um, and then they see a scene of rumpled hearth rugs general rumpling. But if you're going to go the whole way, do you summon a servant by a bell? Probably no, not. <laughs> probably not, and you might do a little bit of tidying up, mightn't you, <laughs> to, to um, deceive, deceive anyway, them. Anyway, it's a good question, and I love it when readers let me know what they think, whether they agree with me or not. Yes, but I mean, uh, the, uh, although she was, uh, I suppose, something of a victim, she wasn't entirely a saint, was she, Caroline? Oh, no, no, she was no. very flirtatious. Um, I would maintain that she didn't actually have lovers until the case was over. She was flung out by George Norton legally. She was separated. They weren't actually divorced, which was a very difficult thing to happen in those days and expensive. And then I think she did have lovers. I think Sidney Herbert, the politician, Yes, he's, he's an interesting figure, isn't he? Because he's very important in the life of Florence Nightingale too, isn't he? Exactly. Yes. Very important. Yes. and, and what, what about Edward Trelawney? Because so you've got a picture of him which, which put me in mind of Terence Stamp playing Captain Troy in Far From the Madding Crowd. And that wonderful scene with the sword. The scene yes. with the sword, yes. Yes, I think that's very good. Edward Trelawney, I don't think, was her lover for what it's worth. 
Right. But I think her admirer. Right. But he was a pretty um, rapey character, wasn't he? Yes. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I mean, she had plenty of men in her life, the young Disraeli, who were admirers, you know. Yes, but, um, yes. And, and then there was a, a young man called William Sterling. Yes. Who was ten years younger than her. A very clever Scotsman. Yes. Who'd written a marvellous book about Spanish painters. She probably had a fling with him in Portugal where it didn't count, you know. Right. And then much later, um, he, they remained friends. He married Lady Anna, had children. Her grandchildren went to stay with him. And then Lady Anna tragically died suddenly. And at the very end of Caroline's life, which I find very romantic, she was really pretty ill. And William Sterling um, came south and took control and protected her and married her. Yes. And she died three months later, but she was married long enough to write a poem saying, call me wife, which yes. given yes. what had happened to her. I, sh I should say that George Norton was dead by now. Yes. Well, I was going to say, it seems to me there's a sort of litany of, of deaths, isn't there, all one after another, and sort of the, the title should have gone to George Norton goes to his son, is that...? Yes. Yes. He, his elder brother, Lord Grantly, had no children, it, it, so yes. he was designated to succeed to the title, but he died before his brother. Yes. As you rightly said, the title has now descended. Um, the present Lord Grantly is obviously descended not only from George Norton, but from Caroline Norton, and was very helpful over this book. Oh, good. Well, I, I dipped into Silver Spoon, which was one of the books that I saw that you consulted. I don't yes. know if you... It was, he was rather a wild character. That would have been the present Lord Grandy's grandfather, and it would have been a grandson, I think, of yes. Caroline. Yes. He was quite an amusing character, wasn't well, he? Well, Caroline made up for not having her children taken away, which happened by wicked George Norton after the action, even though she was innocent, by bringing up her two grandchildren. Yes. Who called her Nonna. You made the very interesting point that um, an unmarried woman at that time had actually more rights over her children than a married woman. That yes, because you see, an unmarried woman was no man's property. Um, therefore, um, her baby wasn't anyone's property. Whereas a married woman, as Caroline Norton said, doesn't exist. Her husband exists. She was the property of her husband. And, I mean, he, he, if, if she published something, he owned the rights to that as well, didn't yes. he? I mean, I mean, she wrote some very critical pamphlets in her campaigns for social justice. Yes. One of them ends, he claims the copyrights, let him claim the copyright to this. Very good, yes. <laughs> and, I mean, what are, what are the other things that she investigated, things like factories, and she was involved in all sorts of... Well, she campaigned things. hard for the Infant Custody Act. Yes. With the revolutionary idea that a woman had the right to have access to her own child, which we find extraordinary, we should have to campaign. And it, the Infant Custody Act was passed in 1839. Then she campaigned for married women to have more rights, um, you know, more protection, property. Yes. And later, um, later, too late for her, the Married Women's Property Act. So but she was really, I mean, something of a forerunner to some very important things which we yes. all accept and today. And her case yeah. was always there as an illustration. You know, why do women need this protection? Look what happened to Caroline Norton. Yes. Because I should say, the three children were under seven and they were taken away. And one of them, the youngest, died yes. after a fall from a pony and injuries which she would have tended and weren't tended. Yes, yes, that was heartbreaking. awful. Heartbreaking. Well, really awful. And she arrived too late, didn't she, to... to, to well, um, I mean, they didn't was... send for her no. until he was dead. Awful, really awful. But we can see her, um, I'm not, if ever we're allowed out again, um, as the, the spirit of justice um, in the House of Lords. Yes, that, that picture is in an arch um, to the left of the speaker's chair, looking at it. And... Um, the House of Parliament burnt down in 1834, and when it was rebuilt, they commissioned historical pictures. That's by Daniel MacLeese. And he chose Caroline Norton as the spirit of justice. And there she is, 
looking absolutely wonderful. And then there are all sorts of liberated people below her, including an emancipated black slave with his shackles cast off beside him, and a child and a mother. It's a wonderful picture. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it in, in mm. reality one day. So would you then say that, I mean, she was pretty well recognised at the time for all the things that she did? Yes, but, but, but she still had no rights, you know. I, th I think she was. I don't think she would complain. Her sister thought she was too, too well recognised. They didn't like the way she wrote letters to the Times. It's a marvellous letter from her, uh, I think, um, it's from her sister, Helen Dufferin, oh, yes. uh, to Lord Dufferin, to Georgina, Duchess of Somerset, elder sister, the great beauty, uh, saying, um, Caroline is upstairs, at it again, her legal stuff. You know. And it's an interesting question. The, the Times would be perfectly happy to publish a letter by a woman in those days. Yes, they did, they and did. particularly when her husband wrote a contradictory letter the next day. Well, they were delighted, I suppose. <laughs> it's great fun getting all those letters up. I mean, God bless the internet. I know. And Hansard, too. Yeah, yes, of course, yes. And do, do, do you think, though, that the story was rather... I find it rather sad at the end, I mean, with the children dying and, and, and sort of the complications of the well, I, marriage of the son. I find so it romantic at the very end, mm -hmm. the marriage to Sir William Sterling. I, I, yes, I, that, yes, but I mean, I was thinking about her own family because she had trouble with the son, with his, with yes. his funny wife and things, didn't yes. he? No, I think it, it, it does contain great sadness, undoubtedly. But throughout it, she never lost her spirit, you know. I mean, I say that I think she had the two greatest virtues. One was courage, and the other was compassion. It's a good combination, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yes. I mean, uh, have you got a... Are you at work on something else now? Am I allowed to ask that, or...? You can ask, but... But you uh, went on say. <laughs> All I will say is that um, nothing um, is going to stop me writing except um, <laughs> some <laughs> act of fate. <laughs> well, that's really good. No, we, we, we want you to continue, mm. certainly. But also, um, you've, you've also been, um, been write, printing some verses, which we're going to hear shortly. We're actually going to hear four pieces, which will be uh, sung by the mezzo-soprano Kitty Waitley with Simon Lepper at the piano. And um, these are your verses um, set to music, which is rather interesting. Is that the first time that that's happened? Absolutely the first time, and it's not interesting, it's thrilling. Uh, thrilling. When John Gillooly rang me to say, would it be possible for Stephen Hoff to set some of the verses to music? I'd, it was the middle of lockdown, a very dire day, and immediately sunshine. I, I can't remember having such a wonderful, pleasant surprise, so I'm honoured. Well, that's exciting. There are so, verses, you yes. see. Verses to please myself. That's what... That's, yes, absolutely. And, and they, um, I was married to a poet. Harold was a poet. Yes. Um, so I know the difference. But I, anyone can write verses. I write verses... If I'm depressed or happy, or I just like doing it. And there quite a lot of, um, of verse appears in virtually all your books, doesn't it? When, when appropriate, I mean, there's quite a lot of. Yes, well, I, mean, I love reading poetry. Yes. So the first one is is um, it's called self isolation. Self isolation. So that's very appropriate for the times that we've lived through. I think that was dated March last year. Yes. I think I wrote it just after it began. And then the uh, magnolias, sort of on that. That was the same thing. Same theme. I was looking at the magnolias um, outside my house. And then the third one, the song of the author on a book tour, that will certainly resonate with any author who's suffered a similar fate. Um, it, it, um, yes, I used to go on a lot of book tours of America, and um, on the one hand, I loved them, and I saw parts of the United States I would never have seen otherwise and met all sorts of interesting people. On the other hand, in, when I wasn't in quite such a jolly mood, I was always at an airport or on my way, you know, and obviously Harold didn't come too. So I think one of the verses, you know, um, in Seattle, I think, you know, it is me talking to him, and it has a chorus of up in the air, the air, 
but it was fun to write. The moment I wrote it, I think I wrote it in San Francisco. I felt oh, right, better. Right. I, uh, um, just after, I was in San Francisco when the fire was at Windsor. Oh, yes. Um, and I turned on television because I was all sorts of hours and saw the Queen sort of dressed up in, uh, and I, I've, uh, somehow Windsor flaming. I thought I've, I've gone mad, or, you know, book tour. This can't be true. And that's when I wrote yes. the book tour. And you've got um, some quite sort of crisp lines of the things that people have said to you on these, tour, on these tours as, as you're yes. signing the books and things. All true. Julian Barnes and yes. others. And then, of course, lastly, On the Balcony, which is a tribute to happy late-night drinks with, with Harold Pinter. We, we have a balcony so. in our house um, in Camden Hill Square. We used to come back uh, only in midsummer you know, when the light was still in the sky. And it was very much what we did, you know, after an evening, just sort of winding down. And one midsummer night after he died, I came back, obviously by myself, and went and sat on the balcony. And then there was only one thing to do, to go and write about it. Otherwise, you know, the tears would be too flowing. It sounds to me as though having the, the gift of writing and being able to express things on the page has been a hugely helpful thing in life. Would you agree with that? I wouldn't mind being able to play a piano. But, but <laughs> it's one here. If you... No, no, I can't. <laughs> not my talent. I like listening. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, I think it's um, almost time to hear, to hear these verses Lovely. now. But thank you thank so you. much for well, thank joining. Thank you, Hugo. Um, I'm, for one, very much looking forward to putting performed at the Wigmore Hall into my, into my CV, <laughs> and I think you should do the same.